religion, a teacher, a public servant, works in state and federal government. Um, but you also spent five years uh, in Alice Springs as manager of community services. And in that time, I'm sure, gained uh, an extraordinary um, insight and first-hand uh, knowledge about what is and what isn't working in relation to, to helping um, the disadvantage facing our Indigenous Australians. Anne Backaway is uh, here representing the Blackwood Reconciliation Group. Uh, Anne is a social worker who migrated from the UK as a young adult, but you've lived in the area for 40 years, so you are definitely a local. Um, and uh, it's wonderful to see the, the local reconciliation community and group getting involved in this campaign. Muzafa Ali um, is a, a wonderful artist and storyteller in his own right, um, a, a former Hazara refugee from Afghanistan. Back there, of course, um, he worked as a, a political analyst and um, you've got some interesting insights into the way politics can unfold in probably some of the most ugliest ways. Um, but you've done a lot for helping particularly the education of children, refugee children uh, in Indonesia and in Thailand. Um, Muzafa won the Fred Hollows Humanitarian of the Year Award uh, last year. Uh, he's also um, produced a number of documentaries and has established uh, the Hazaras for Yes, which is uh, a group that is working uh, to encourage uh, those who uh, from various multicultural community groups to get behind this Yes campaign. So we're really keen to hear your insights into all of this as well. Why, why you're involved in this campaign, what the voice uh, means to you and, and why you're voting yes and we might start and um, maybe we'll start with Bruce. Thanks. We'll just make sure everyone's <coughs> microphone's on. Make sure they're all turned on. Up is on. Up is on. Yeah. Up is on. There okay. we go. <laughs> first of all, I, the first thing I want to say is something I'm not. I'm not a member of any political party. What I am is uh, a representative like the United Church, very conscious of the fact that when you represent a congregation such as like the United, that there may be some people who want to vote no. Um, but I'm also aware that representing the United Church, that within the United Church, there is an organisation known as the uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Christian Congress, I think, is a great title. Uh, and they, of course, will very strongly support the yes vote. So on their behalf, I'm more than more than happy to do so. My background and my reason for voting yes is quite clear. I've been involved with Aboriginal people since I was eight years old. My experiences have varied greatly, and the three years in Alice Springs have convinced me that this needs to happen. Um, I'm the oldest statesman here today. I'm 87 years old. This will be my last referendum. <laughs> Our constitution has a huge hole in it. It doesn't even mention anywhere the word Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people. That hole needs to be filled. It needs an acknowledgement. I see this as my last opportunity to correct something that I see as wrong. I hope you'll join with me in doing the same. Thank you, Bruce. I might go to Sally. Um, you've obviously been so involved on the front line for getting the voice to this point. You've been in negotiations with uh, government, uh, with your community. You're an official spokesperson for the Uluru Statement and the Uluru Dialogue. Tell us what really drives, drives you. So for me, I had no clue about the Constitution until I went to the regional dialogues. Um, and they came out of um, the Tony Abbott, Julia Gillard, um, that tic-tac-toe who is Prime Minister, that era of leadership. So 
they, you know, people would remember there was that recognised movement. You know, we need to recognise Aboriginal people. Aboriginal people weren't supportive of that because it was about symbolism. It was just about let's just recognise you guys. And um, the referendum council actually went back to Abbott at that stage and said we need to actually do something better and more substantial. And I got this invitation to go to this dialogue at Ross River, which is two hours out of Alice Springs. I was like, what is this? Like, what, what is this meeting? I, the Central Land Council had invited me and I went along with, it was incredible to sit and learn about our civics and learn about this, this constitution and the race course we have now, section 26. What was on the table and the symbolic sort of recognition and straight away this community member said, no, we don't want that. The biggest driver out of all of this, and this is, this is in the Northern Territory where we've had the intervention and there were so many community members sitting there talking about, people talk about the intervention, but they don't actually talk about the loss of community organisations and community councils and community voices at that day-to-day -day level of that community input into what's going on in our communities. And that was a bigger driver for me because I'm from a remote community. I moved down to Adelaide a couple of years ago because of this work, but I'm a bush kid. I've seen the failures of government time and time and time again. I use an example, <laughs> I don't know where she is nowadays, but this is from 14 years ago. A Labor minister, an Aboriginal Affairs Labor minister, when a my community had said to her, we want to subsidise the cost of freight to our remote communities. Because at that stage, we were paying $14 for an iceberg lettuce. Uh, for two tomatoes, we paying eight bucks from, um, you know, 20 pack of black and gold, not huggies, black and gold, nappies, you're buying it for $48. Um, instead of subsidising the cost of freight, uh, she chose to build market gardens. Now, I'm from the desert, arid country, calcium, water, like there was no program with it. There was no ongoing cost for it. Like it wasn't going to work and she was told by everyone, this is not going to work. We want to subsidise the cost of freight. She chose to do market gardens. So that's one example from 14 years ago. And we got the blame. She wasted almost a million dollars of money. We got the blame. Oh, those Aboriginal people, they don't know what to do and how to look after their country. Look again, we're wasting more money. You know, we all hear those rhetorics. And so for me, this opportunity to be involved in this, where out of Uluru, this Aboriginal leadership, this incredible group of Aboriginal leaders said, and we're not going to issue to it the Parliament, we're not going to issue to it the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister. We're actually going to issue it to all Australians. Because this is about changing this constitution, this document, this really old document that was done by a bunch of men off a, on a ship off the coast of Sydney. Didn't include women didn't include Aboriginal people because they said, thought that we would die out by then. Think about that. Didn't include women and didn't include Aboriginal people at all. And they made the constitution so difficult because they wanted to protect themselves, protect their assets. So that's why we had a double majority. And it's, you know, and this, for me, why I'm voting yes is because this is a, there's two problems to this. It's about our recognition as Torres Strait Islander and Aboriginal people from this country, but it's also about our representation. So when there's laws and policies that ministers and senators make, we can actually sit there and go, hey, can you stop thinking like we're all the same communities? Or you're about to waste a million dollars that no one cares for on a program that we know is not gonna exist after three months. That's why I'm voting yes. 
because we're living in the no. no. We are currently living in the world of no. There's no opportunities, there is no future foresight for our kids. We're living in no proper health comes for our communities. We're living in a no opportunity space where there's a dictatorship to us rather than a journey of yes and together. The other members of the Blackwood uh, Reconciliation Group. Well, well, I can talk about myself and I can talk about the Blackwood Reconciliation Group. That's, that's two things. Um, what I wanted to say is when I arrived here in 1977, I didn't know anything at all about Aboriginal people. I knew they existed, but that was all. I came from England. And guess what? I came here so easily. I had so much privilege straight away. I wasn't even planning to stay. I was just travelling around the world. I had easy, free entry to this country because I was born in Britain. I got a pathway to permanent residence within months. And I got work very easily. The privilege that I brought with me entered me into a very privileged section of this society. I was born in 1952 and I rapidly learned once I got here that an Aboriginal person who was born in 1952, wouldn't even have been classed as a citizen. They were likely to have been stolen from their family of origin. They were likely to have been forced to live on mission stations. There were limits on where they could go and what they could do. And as a social worker, and I've worked here as a social worker for over 40 years, um, I saw those, that imbalance of privilege playing out time and time again. So that's what motivates me as a person. And I'll try and be brief. Blackwood Reconciliation Group. Do most of you know the Colville site in Blackwood? Does anybody not know the Colville site? So I don't need to talk about that. I, I think it would be helpful. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, well, as a local, I discovered the Colville site in the 90s, which is when the Blackwood Reconciliation Group was forming and working with the Chibi Chuta, who are the people who were resident at Colville or their descendants. She should acknowledge that Bianca's mothers were both residents at Colville. If there's anybody else in the room who has that connection, I don't know, I'm sorry that I don't. But I discovered it because my children were going there on a school excursion, so I, I didn't join the group at that stage because I was working full time, but I went to various events there as the artworks were created, as the memorials were created, and kept in touch And my good friend Di, who's over there, who I worked with 20 years ago, was involved, you've been involved for over a decade, haven't you? So when I retired, I wanted to get involved in something local and I wanted to get involved in something that contributed to reconciliation because I felt in my career I hadn't done as much of that as I would like to have done. Um, so it is a memorial site to the stolen generation children, 350 children who grew up in this community who were stolen from all over South Australia. And uh, it's a beautiful place to visit if you haven't visited. Um, Rosifa, how, where, where did you come, come to, uh, or come from to this issue? And I, I remember when I first uh, spoke to you about this, you were talking about um, thinking about the privilege of being able to come to Australia, to migrate to Australia, uh, to the welcome that you've been given. Can you unpack some of that for us? I'm, to be honest, uh, I'm maybe the newest person to come to Australia. <laughs> I came to Australia just seven years ago. Uh, but for me, the Australia today, or the time when I arrived in 2015, for me, this is the most beautiful place to live, where uh, we tend to listen to each other. The most beautiful place, the impact that I see today, in this moment, is that we are sitting here from different backgrounds, with beliefs, with different uh, uh, ethnic backgrounds or uh, ideologies. It's such a good place where we can sit together and we can talk together. 
in this listening, we listen to each other to our voice. For the first time in my uh, time here during this campaign that I do, first time I talk with uh, our non supporters. Welcome. This is the beauty of Australia. When we welcome, we sit together, we talk to each other. And I think the best thing is we share our concerns. The best thing is that I think what connects us is that we share the same concern as a nation that the government policies hasn't worked for the Aboriginal people. There is no doubt in it. There is one thing that brings us here. We are all concerned about our First Nations people. Whether we vote yes or we vote no. I vote yes. I campaign for yes. But we share the same concern. We want to change this. We want to be part of this. I see, as Bruce said, this might be his last uh, referendum. This is my first referendum. Mm -hmm. And with a lot of the uh, multicultural communities, this could be the first, um, first referendum. For me, why I became passionate about is the connection we have. I'm from Afghanistan. I'm from the Hazara community. More than 60% of the Hazara people got killed in Oroska during 1890s persecution. We were the majority and we were reduced to minority. My grandfather was uh, enslaved, his siblings got killed, and his sister, we don't know what happened to her. Someone took her away. We know the same thing happened to our Aboriginal people. The time when I arrived as an artist, I remember in 2015 there was turn on the art exhibition going and immediately I went to see the art pieces. I was just um, amazed how these indigenous art, how powerful they are. And I took selfies with some of those artists and I realized that these people lived here for more than 60,000 years. And all of a sudden I found myself on this ancient land. And then I was sitting and taking photos and listening to their stories. And then I was thinking, what happened to these communities? They come from the remotest communities from Australia. What happens to them? That was such a different story that I could see in Adelaide, where I was uh, resettled. It's a totally different story. So I studied um, Aboriginal culture in university, and I was more into uh, learning about the uh, First Nations people and their culture. So my second documentary, which is called Watanda, uh, my countrymen investigate or delve into this connection, how we are connected in Australian society, in the fabrics of Australia. Of course, we are much more connected. That's the tagline of the film. The Watanda goes and meets. Uh, I'm the character where I find these uh, descendants of the Afghan Cambodians who came during the 1860s to 1920s, uh, their descendants are still living here. They are with us, uh, they are artists, they, uh, they represent all walks of life. Uh, they could be in outback Australia, they could be living in, uh, in, in the cities. And I find those connections, you know, I'm not new, I'm not irrelevant. Yes, we have these deep connections. We have this contribution in modern Australia to make it uh, the modern Australia in terms of infrastructure, the communications. I think pri proud of, of this connection. But the time when I went to uh, those small towns like Lithurst, where up to 20 people live, and I find this one uh, descendant of Afghan Camilliers who is also Aboriginal, and he tells me that, am I an Afghan Camillier descendant? No. Am I Aboriginal? No. Because why? He was a stolen generation. He lost everything. And we sit on that table. We cry. Because I can feel the pain. Yes, that happened to my grandfather. That happened to me. When I returned in Afghanistan in 2005, I couldn't go to Oroskan where my grandfather was taken away from her, his family, where he lost his lands because the security was so bad. But I think why uh, I get passionate is about, as you said, Senator Hanson Young, we have just two choices, yes or no. 
We have just two choices. There is no maybe, there is no preference. And what I see in my visits in remote communities, it's not just that I, I slept one night and walked in the morning, to wake up in the morning, I say yes, but it's about the connections that I made, I talked, discussed with my uh, fellow old countrymen, the Wathandars, I say, that they support this, they want a change in their life. Of course I want to say to our no supporters, there are Aboriginal people, they say, no, I met them, I talked to them. There are the Afghan Kamila descendants who say, no, I respect, but overwhelming majority of these uh, communities, they say yes. They want a change in their life. As you said, saying, yes, we live in the era of no. We are concerned of the, the staggering money you showed me. That's staggering money. It doesn't have any impact. 40 billion annually. 40 billion dollars. We don't have impact. We don't know where it's Why going. it doesn't, why we don't see any impact. I think this is the time we, 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 we come into this place and we can have a say. <coughs> and I could go and quietly say yes in the ballot paper, but I decided to educate my community. Thank educate you. my community to say we have this responsibility, we have this connection in Australia and we can make the right decision, which is yes for me. Thank you. Um, we heard from Rowan in, uh, in his presentation the difference between um, why we are being asked uh, to amend the Constitution uh, to acknowledge uh, First Nations people and to put in the Constitution uh, the ability for uh, Indigenous people to advise and give advice to government and parliaments. And Sally, I might ask you first, why do you think it's important that we have a constitutional voice and not just the parliament decide uh, that we to give Aboriginal people a voice through just a legislation? Um, biggest thing is because the legislation can be written away. In one afternoon, it can be done away with. And that means all the programs and policies and the, um, the ways that the structures have been can be done away with. Um, we saw this with ATSIC. ATSIC was running not just um, it was running with regional and remote voices feeding up and feeding down. So you had that grassroots group. You had the, the information flowing and outcomes were great. Like you had community representation and then they got away with that. And, you know, they had this hand-picked advisory board or group with no one really knows who's there or, or they have NIAA and all this sort of stuff, but it's this, uh, the amount of times that we, as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community members and from regional, remote and urban communities have had to fit our ways of thinking and structures and conform it into what the government of the day want us to. That's happened time and time again. And when we get used to that way, they get rid of it. Or better yet, they don't actually tell us. They don't tell us. They come to us and say, this is what we're doing now. You've got to do it like this now. Um, and no traction can happen. Like I gave one example of stupid market gardens. That's one minister wanting to have her own ideas and policy. You know, the amount of times like I, I think about, I think about the the conversation around the free the flag, the power times, and how nasty that got, and how hard that got. Imagine if the voice was there, you know, because ATSIC used to be there and support how and what that looked like, and you know, I guess it's now free for everyone to use Aboriginal flag on the products and things. But there's those different structures that happen. But it's the thing that we look at so much is that. It's, it's that representation needs to be there so it can't be done away with the next government or the next government or whatever. So if someone who has a we will, no, let's get rid of it, that's not working. 
you know, because Aboriginal people, we constantly have to audition. We always have to show up and put our best foot forward. You know, Pat Anderson talks about that every time there's a new government, and it won't be the same government gets voted in. It's this, it's a new government because they like to rejig who's the minister or whatever, and you know, the executive government underneath is having a little shift around. So we have to go and reintroduce ourselves and talk about why our program needs funding and why it's successful. You know, and sometimes that we're not we're not in the room. We're not invited in. You know, sometimes, you know, I think about that intervention. So many, so many programs came to Central Australia. I was I was living there, I grew up in Alice Springs. So many programs came there. And I mean this no disrespect for the space that we're in. But I call it the care bears. There was the Wesley Care, United Care, Anglia Care, uh, Relationships Australia. <laughs> Something there was some all these different programs all came there to do all these programs around youth and youth justice. And you know what happened? The Aboriginal organisations that were there, they got suffered. They got they got their voices got snuffed out. Because all of these organisations were going for the same pool of money. The over Aboriginal run and organisations that had been there for a long time, that were doing a great job, who were working with communities, which were working with families, were starved out of that opportunity. So that money never hit those Aboriginal communities. Those kids fell through the cracks. You know, and they talk about, you know, the, one of the biggest policies that the Greens have got around the, with the housing stuff. I say welcome to the housing crisis. Because Aboriginal people have been talking about housing crisis for a long time. We have families and families and families, four generations that live in one household. We have tuberculosis in the Asian wildlands at the moment. That's a preventative disease. We have cows in build water. You know, we have certain centers that say that all oh, colonization was good for us because we now have running water. Well, there's Aboriginal communities that have poison water, that have uranium water, that have gas water. Yarrow community outside of Cairns has to go and fill up water tanks in Cairns and drive it back because there's too much iron in their water. All of these things we wouldn't be okay with our communities having. I used to sit on the board of a, the APY Council and we had an SA water come in and they were like, the calcium levels are on the margins. It's on the margins, there okay, it's on the margins. I was like, on the margins of what? <laughs> and they were like, oh, look, you know, if it was a little bit higher, then it would be a problem. I was like, so it's literally on the margins of being okay. And I literally asked them, so if that was Burnwood Council, if you were advising that, would that be okay for them? He was like, no. I was like, so why is it okay for my communities? He had no answer. That's how, that was an essay water. Telling me my communities are okay with this particular type that's not okay for anyone else. And you think about how many programs, how many stuff that is going on, that that's the, that's the level of care that we're getting on the margins, on the fringes of okay. Not the best, not what everyone else is entitled to, not what everyone else has got the right to, but just the okay bit. And so, I look at that and go, that's why we need it in that legislation. We need it in the constitution because with the legislative stuff, they can get rid of it. They can get rid of it. They can, they've shown us decades and decades and decades ago. And also this founding document, this document that's 122 years old, written by nine white men on a boat that did include women, that didn't include, we're scared of the Chinese. 
didn't want to include Aboriginal people because we were going to be dead by then. Didn't want to recognise us and didn't want to have any representation by us. That's what we're talking about, a 122-year-old document. Now, are we really reflecting on the past 122 years and saying, yeah, yeah, that's the same as Australia. We're okay with it staying in this status quo. But the last successful referendum <laughs> was in 1977. 1977. And you know what that was for? Does anyone know? Except you, you're a lawyer. <laughs> A term limit for High Court judges. <laughs> and you know in the, high, the section about the High Court judges, they say judges are he. <laughs> but like that is why this is, like it is such a small, like this document, that is why we need to be included. It's about representation, but it's also about our recognition. It's about unifying this country. It's about us coming together for a better Australia. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> and I want to ask you, uh, did you go to the Yes Walk uh, in Adelaide yes. last weekend? Yes. Um, what was that like? Uh, I went to the Sydney one, I wasn't at the other one, so genuinely interested. <laughs> um, but what was it like to be surrounded by so many South Australians who are hearing these arguments uh, and, and are seizing this opportunity for change? That is a great question. It was one of the most uplifting experiences I've ever had, I think, because there were so many more people there than anybody had expected. Um, I've heard quotes of about 10,000 people. I think they were expecting two or 3,000. So people had turned up who hadn't registered. and. It was exhilarating to be with so many people and to see a new bump into people that you know that didn't, you didn't know were going, uh, people that you hadn't seen for a few years. Um, and to do that walk with everybody chanting and singing together was just very, very uplifting. And then when I was walking in the, the Sydney march, it struck me that um, there's this desperation for the country to be united a desperation for us to um, put behind us and bring you, you spoke of this, and the wrongs of the past, mm -hmm. and move forward together. When I was looking around at the crowd in Sydney, I was thinking, this is an extraordinarily diverse section of the community. That's true. Younger people, older people, you know, from all walks of life. Um, but it was a, I, I felt inspired as well. Um, and, and what it, it showed me, that if we can get all of those people um, out on, a, on referendum day, and if you were at that walk here in Adelaide, um, we need you to, to put your hand up and help on polling booths. We need you to be there on the day wearing your t-shirts and saying, um, I'm just a local member of my community and I'm doing the one thing I can. Bruce, I'd like to go to you. Um, you mentioned that this will be your last referendum. Um, how did, we don't know that. Well, we don't know that. <laughs> we don't know that. Uh, but you, you suspect. Um, how, how have you been talking about this issue with your friends and your family and, and people in your community? I've been approaching it as, as a very practical thing. To look at the words themselves that are proposed, I can't find any threat there to the sovereignty of Parliament, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, it, there is nothing to fear. I, and I am concerned <coughs> and talk to my family and friends about the fears that are being raised by people who say no. Fear is a very powerful weapon. If you want to maintain the status quo, use fear. It will always work. So I talk more in positive terms about what it might achieve. 
I, I think to have a voice enshrined in the Constitution is a, an absolute first step. I want to say it's, it's not new. Let me introduce you to William Cooper. 1933, he started to gather a petition that was addressed to the King of England. And the petition basically said, we want a voice in Parliament for Aboriginal people. It's gone on since 1933. I was born in 1936, and it happened just before that time. I remember Sir Douglas Nichols, Doug Nichols, he was Pastor Doug when I, on this occasion, addressing a meeting in Melbourne that I attended in the late 1950s. And Doug was pleading with the government and with the people of Australia to do something about the desperate plight that he had discovered in that his travelling across the country through the Warburton Ranges, for example, of what he said we are doing to my people. Since 1970s, we've had seven organisations that have advised the government, at least seven, there were probably others, and there have been individuals like Warren and me. And, uh, each one of them has disappeared. It has to be in the Constitution to avoid that happening again. How dare we deny the request of Aboriginal people that goes back a hundred years at least, that are still with us, and all they're saying is, please consult us before you make decisions about our lives. It also follows the requirement of the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. As far as possible, we should be giving to Aboriginal people the right to self-determination. This is a two-sided thing, the voice of Parliament. One side is that we have to listen. The other side is that Aboriginal people have to take responsibility. And I think we sometimes see it as one side. Aboriginal people will do far better when they take responsibility and are given the opportunity, again, to take responsibility for their own lives and their own programs. And that's part of what the voice is about. Thank you, Bruce. Very well. <laughs> <laughs> and you think I'm going to read something to us there, if possible, yes? Please, Bruce has got a book. This is a, a history book that I discovered from a local person in Blackwood that was written in 1932 as the story of Australia's history and was used as the main text in high schools until the late 50s, I think. And I'm just picking up on what Bruce said about fear because this historian describes in detail the murders of Aboriginal people by the settlers and also describes the deliberate poisoning of food in order to reduce the Aboriginal population. And his analysis, he says, he was talking about Queensland in this chapter, but as in Tasmania, the root of the trouble was fear. The early settlers and sheep men thinly spread over vast areas and frightened for the safety of their wives and children were too easily provoked into shooting the natives. And, and I apologise about the language um, because it's using inappropriate language, but it says the blacks naturally angry at being driven from their old hunting grounds, were ready to take vengeance. Perhaps the Queensland blacks would not have, would have, would not have responded to Sturt's gentler method of treatment. But we have to confess, it was never tried. The blacks were met by organised hunting and shooting parties of whites, and worse still, there were fiendish stories of poisoned food being offered to the natives under the cloak of friendship. And this next phrase is important. Not until the whites were settled in such numbers as to make their eventual conquest certain did their hostility to the blacks diminish. By that time, the fear had vanished. As the result of protests by humane people in Brisbane and elsewhere, the killing off policy was abandoned and the last days of the dying race are being passed in a better atmosphere of mercy and succour from their white brethren. That was 1932, nearly a hundred years ago. So to pick up on what Sally was saying, the constitution was built on a very, very fear-driven and sick foundation 
And I think that continues to permeate our society. And uh, thank you, and um, reflecting on, on, on those descriptions and the, and the point that um, uh, Bruce is making about uh, fear and the, the use of fear uh, in, and, you know, we, we know in political campaigns, uh, you know, from a, um, from a, a lot of, I've been involved in a lot of political campaigns over my, my time in politics, and fear is an easy way. It's a shortcut way. Uh, don't discuss the, the details. Don't uh, listen to the uh, to the arguments. Don't mount your own arguments. Uh, but but just use fear. And we've we've seen that. It's not just in, this, in Australian politics. We've seen that around the world. Um, Musafa, reflecting on what Anne has just written. <clears throat> How do you speak to people in your community and in um, those groups that you're working with in terms of uh, the multicultural uh, communities in South Australia to deal with those questions of fear uh, and say, this is nothing to be fearful of. This is actually a step towards uniting our nation and putting behind us the terrible things that have been done in the past. Uh, what I really, as a, as a new comer in Australia and a new citizen in Australia, I would say that Australia is not complete without fairness. And the fairness doesn't come uh, unless our Aboriginal communities you know, uh, get the agency to be where they want to be. And this uh, referendum is all about that giving agency and the voice. Um, my communities know this because we have been subject to fear. We have been subject to propaganda, uh, being refugees or migrants in Australia. Uh, yeah, we were branded as bold people. We were called uh, uh, others. Whereas, yeah, we are taxpayers in Australia. We run the economy, we're part of this big machine um, to run Australia as a, as a prosperous country. But being on the other side, being you know branded as Muslims and terrorists, we have faced this. Like I, I say this as a Muslim, even though I'm not a very, we have a very very good Muslim, <laughs> but we become the victims. You know, uh, my daughter was uh, facing this uh, in the school, uh, on the streets, and uh, being this part of the side is very difficult to cope with that situation. And there are two ways to respond. Yes, being aggressive, we as human beings, of course we have emotions. But I think the best way is to respond is love. That's the universal language. This is what Uluru Statement is all about. Listen to us. This is why we are here to listen. And our indigenous communities want to be heard, want to take part in this listening process. This is where we listen to each other here. Uh, for me to talk with my communities and going through this uh, side of this uh, story being as a victim of fear, it's very easy to talk to them. And I haven't seen one single Hazara in my community who would oppose the referendum. They all, 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 all of them say yes, we will vote yes. And they know what is happening to our Aboriginal brothers and sisters in Australia. And I think they know that this is the opportunity that they can vote yes and they can be proud of this because they think it's a, it's a way that you know, we live in this uh, Aboriginal land um, and it's not just being tokenism and say we acknowledge we are living in the Aboriginal land but why we get the opportunity to vote yes and no and then we refrain with, with no I think this is where I guess we want to be practically part of this. This is an acknowledgement, this is a contribution. We did uh, some um, campaigns all over Australia, in Queensland, in uh, South Australia, in uh, Victoria, in, in Perth, and um, the camera. Uh, the response from uh, multicultural communities have been amazing, particularly the Hazaras. Uh, we went to the shops, so some of our shopkeepers, they just took away their brochures from uh, their business brochures and put 
the, um, the, the yes referendum brochures on this to replace it because they thought, yes, I will be proud to be part of this whole campaign. Because we know the pain actually. We know, I, I really wish as a refugee, I really wish as a Hazara person from Afghanistan, we had the same opportunity in Afghanistan to have our voice in the constitution, to have this beautiful democracy where we could have referendums to listen to each other. We didn't have that. But in Australia, we do have this beautiful uh, system where we can campaign, we can listen to each other. Uh, and I think my job is the easiest job uh, in all of these communities. I go and everyone welcomes and they probably just put this yes campaign posters in their shop. Thank you. Um, I want to ask each of you now um, what you want Sunday the 15th of October to look like, the day after the referendum. We can have you reflect a little bit on the things that you've said the hope that you have for what this referendum will deliver, why it's important. Bruce, would you, like, would you be able to start us off? Me? Yes. Oh, gosh, I hope I wake up and think through. <laughs> 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 but yes, it's been successful. I, I think we've got to see this as, as a golden opportunity. An opportunity to establish something that will really while it is very significant, is really a very conservative change. But a change that is so significant because it means that we acknowledge that people were here for 60 odd thousand years before any of my ancestors arrived. The fact that we now recognize that the gap that has occurred as a result of that settlement that came later that gap can be closed, and it will be closed more readily by listening to Aboriginal people themselves. I truly believe that. When I was working in Alice Springs quite a few years ago, I was excited about some of the programs that the Aboriginal women had, had started. They, some of them were saying, we're fed up with the alcohol abuse, we're fed up with the domestic abuse, we're fed up with all of these things that are happening and they started programs that reinforce Aboriginal culture. And out of those, some, they were some of the most successful programs that we saw develop in our street. They started them without any support whatsoever. They eventually got some government support. It's reinforcement to me of the fact that when we listen and when we respond, I want to talk just for a second about listening. Some people have said that we need to vote no because this will be a divisive thing. I have never listened carefully to what another person was saying and walked away afterwards and felt more divided than I did united with them. And that's what we're talking about. This is not divisive. It will bring us closer together and I would rejoice at that as I hope you will. things I learned very early on in my journey in Australia as I got to know Aboriginal people was how loving and generous and how extraordinarily resilient they are. And I was overawed by that because I'm not sure that I would be as resilient as a person given what I know Aboriginal people have been through. So what I want Sunday the 15th to look like is an absolute celebration and acknowledgement and validation of that resilience and beauty and culture and the triumph of love over fear. The first step of the triumph of love over fear. Australia said yes 
and this will give me a belief that yeah, we are a great nation. Uh, we care about each other, we listen to each other, and we reject fear. Um, we uh, are a progressive nation, and uh, you know, I would say this uh, whole voice is uh, something, such a humble ask, such a humble and uh, uh, and uh, modest idea that came from our First Nations people. It's not an iPhone. Even iPhone, Apple keep updating this and a lot of people want something, this voice to be like an iPhone. They need more details. This is not an idea. This is just an idea of having a voice and uh, being uh, able to give advice to the government. And then on that Sunday, I really want to wake up and be proud and say, yes, we got this idea and now it's up to our First Nations people to uh, come up and grasp this as an opportunity and our politicians like you to move forward from there. So as, as Australians, we will, we will uh, do our part. We will play our role. Thank you. So we'll be on our uh, Sally, you must have thought about this a lot. Mm, yes and no. <laughs> um, it, it's like what Professor and Bruce had said, that opportunity. For me, on, so hopefully Anthony Green has told us that it's a yes on a Saturday night. That you know we're somewhere having a party. No, wake up at twelve o'clock on Sunday, not at seven o'clock or six thirty when my sons go. Ah. Um, but for me, that's when our job starts. Whatever happens on October the fifteenth, this is it going to change what Australia will look like. If it's a no. It will be the most devastating blow to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. It will be devastating for the chance to right the wrongs that are in the policies and the programs in government. Um, because not every Aboriginal person wants to be a senator not, or a politician, and you know we talk, we often hear this thing about, oh, have you got eleven um, First Nations ministers? Yeah. But they're representing their party. <laughs> they're a blue voice, they're a red voice, there is not a teal voice, um, there is a green voice, but that's not a black voice. So they're there representing their constituencies, their party lines, and we want that opportunity for us to be there without what's going on in our Aboriginal Trust Island community. <coughs> you know, those, those issues around, oh, they, Aboriginal people get so much money. Yeah, but that doesn't actually hit the floor. It doesn't hit the ground. Why? Why? Well, that's why we want to fix it. It's to get stuck. We're not going to fix it when we've got a corrupt corporation calling itself a government. They are not a government. So that's what I need to say. They have an ADN. So that's what we need to change. That's the conversation. It is getting in that space and saying the those programs. Are to yes, it is. Our, our voice is in there is going to say what we're doing, what is going on currently is not working. What is currently going on is not working. I could, you know, there's the closing the gap. We see those things. We see those numbers. They say that value. What I want is my Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander communities to be at that forefront, to be leading those conversations. To actually being heard in those conversations, being a part of the solutions, because we know the solutions. We know the solutions. Like that minister 14 years ago, everyone told her it's not going to work. A market garden in the desert is not going to work, and she didn't listen. That's one example, as I said, one example from 14 years ago. But on that October 15th, on that Sunday, we're going to wake up to a different Australia, whichever way it is. Hopefully it's a yes and we're going to have a lot of work to do because it's giving my communities the best opportunity.
to lean in and lean hard and get going. Please do not forget to put hands together to like, subscribe and share your comments.